Emerita of Law at the Columbus School of Law, the Catholic University of America. I am uh, the director of the American Law Program and the LLM Program, which Catholic University do in cooperation with Jagiellonian University in Krakow for many years. I will be your moderator. Christina D'Amelia Lopez, Director of Advancement in the Law School's Development and Alumni Relations Office, will now bring greetings from the Columbus School of Law of the Catholic University of America. Thank you, Professor Wortham. And thanks again, I wanna thank you once again this week for your leadership and vision and the execution of such an outstanding virtual program, as you just said. We've had um, very, very few hiccups and a lot of participation. Professor Wortham's commitment and all the energy she has to foster and grow the relationship with the best school in Poland, the Jagiellonian University, again, cannot be understated. I think we say that every week and we see that every week in the programs. Now in 2021, Professor Wortham continues to invigorate and nurture these deep roots of the program. As we know, the 30 year relationship between Catholic law and the Jagiellonian University began with the founder emeritus professor Rhett Lud <laughs> Bukowski. I, I, we practice this every week and I still mess it up. <laughs> but it's a new year. And while we're hopeful to begin meeting in person again, at some point in the next several months, we hope, we celebrate what a successful model this has been in the webinar series. It bring, it's really brought a lot of people together who would not have been brought together around shared experiences, expertise, and the like. We would like to welcome you all and um, the International Business and Trade Summer Law Program, the American Law Program, the LLM in American Law now have more than 2000 US Polish and other international alumni. As with each of the unique programs, the panelists today are really superb. And um, I can't understate that. I've learned so much as a non-legal person as well, I think the whole community of people who have logged on have. Um, it's been superb really growing our global community and continuing the dialogue between Catholic law and, and the Jagiellonian programs. Thanks for being here with us. We value your participation and look forward to seeing you again continued in this forum. Thanks, Professor. Thank you. Uh, now, Wojciech Banczyk, coordinator of the American Law School, will welcome you on behalf of the Jagiellonian University. Thank you very much, Professor Wortham. Dear participants of this series of webinars, it's a great pleasure for me to be uh, express on behalf of the Jagiellonian University the great joy that you all joined us in the online meeting, showing your particular interest in contemporary challenges in the American and global law. This position allows me to present the gratitude to all the persons without whom it will never be possible for this event to happen. Additionally, it allows to announce uh, what a great prize for a university it is to organize, to co organize such an interesting event, as well as many other initiatives together with the Catholic uh, University of America throughout many, many years of cooperation. This program proves that the fruitful cooperation between our two universities continues despite the difficult pandemic situation. Given the current difficulties, but also current challenges, the traditional way in which the joint programs used to be held uh, we decided to develop a new initiative so that in the absence of traditional inside meetings, but also of growing popularity of online meetings, we could offer a new way to learn and to meet together. We are very happy to observe a very huge popularity of the webinar series. Thus, for months, they keep gathering as huge audience as nearly 200 participants for each webinar and almost 1,500 altogether. At the same time, we do hope that we will all sooner or later meet in person during our programs or alumni meet events. This webinar series is a team effort starting with the support of Dean Stephen Payne of the Catholic, of Catholic University and Dean Jerzy Pichlinski, Dean of the Faculty of Law and Administration of Jagiellonian University. It draws on the leadership and staff of the Jagiellonian Center for Foreign Law School Cooperation, often referred to by its Polish acronym OXPO, and the Catholic University and Law School Development and Alumni Relations and Communications Offices, as well as the help of our LLM coordinators and LLM graduates, Luke Bartosik and Gaspar Koch. 
please check the webinar, the website for information on the February and March webinars in the winter series, the URLs in the chat. You can also there find the links for the recordings for the six webinars for the fall series and the first two webinars in the winter series. Our February 24th webinar, our next one, features CUA Professor Heidi Schooner discussing how well the post-2008 financial crisis regime prepared the world for the COVID-19 pandemic, with comments from Greenberg Troig partner and former American Law School coordinator, Miha Bobzinski. On March 3rd, we're pleased that CUA Professor Kara Drynan will discuss ideas developed in her Oxford University Press book, The War on Kids, How American Juvenile Justice Lost Its Way. We're honored that our commenter will be Jagiellonian's own Chair of Criminal Law and Polish Supreme Court Justice, Wodomierz Wrubel. Our March 24th webinar series features LLM graduate Gaspar Cote talking about the EU's new sustainable development regulation, which will impact not only Europe, but most of those in the US involved in funds investment. Our commenter is distinguished CUA JD graduate Chris Concanon, who is president and chief operating officer of Market Access, a global electronic trading platform for institutional investors and dealers around the world. So we have really a terrific uh, agenda there in uh, our future, uh, the rest of the winter series. We hope you'll join us. I have a few updates about the Cooperative Catholic University and Jagiellonian programs. For those of you on this call who are American Law Program graduates, we now have determined that the visa, border, and health rules in place will allow LLM students to enter the US in May for the CUA summer session component. This means the LLM students who were not able to come last summer can come, but also we can admit additional students to the LLM if any of you out there have already completed the ALP and are interested in proceeding on the LM this summer and coming to the United States, that can be possible, but it requires very quick action. So if that is something that would interest you, um, Luke is gonna put in the chat my email. It's also on the program website. Please email me if that might be a possibility because this would require, and I realize you might have lots of questions, that's not a problem. You don't have to know you wanna do it. But if you think you might wanna do it, please be in touch right away because we would have to act quickly. Unfortunately, the law school has determined that the situation in Europe is too uncertain to go forward with our summer programs in Europe. So we did announce just in the past couple of days that our Rome and Krakow summer programs are suspended for this summer. So they will not resume until 2022. So proceeding with the summer program this summer is not an option, but we hope to see you in 2022. We are cautiously optimistic that travel and health conditions will allow the live American law program to go forward in 2021. We're glad that so many Polish law students and practitioners have joined us in this series, and we hope to see many of you in the American Law Program next year. We will continue to monitor the health and border situation, and we will be announcing as the webinar series goes along about what will be happening with the American Law Program next year. So now we turn to today's program by Katarzyna Strzyniak, followed by comments by Karen Tramontano. Kasia, please go ahead and put your screen share up while I say about a few words about how we organize the webinar and also introduce you and Karen. I expect most of you use Zoom or a similar video conferencing platform so you know about typing questions in the chat. I'll be taking the questions from the chat and addressing them to our speakers and you can type your question there directly. If you would rather, you can go to the drop down where it says everyone and instead select my name or Wojtek Banczyk's name or uh, Luke Bartosik and then send us a question privately, which we can pose for you. In addition, if you see a friend or classmate is on, you can also send a private message to say hello or check in with them. That's all can be done from the chat. If also, if you go to gallery view, you can uh, of course see the screens of the people who are on. 
So Ms. Strinyak will talk for about 20 minutes and she'll be followed by a comment from Ms. Dramantano, who will also lead the question and answer period. This question is being recorded and the 60 minute webinar will be posted on CUA's YouTube channel within a few days. The series website links to these recordings as well. At the end of the 60 minutes, I'll close the formal webinar and the recording will cease. Ms. Strinyak and Ms. Tramontano have graciously agreed to stay on for up to a half an hour so we can take more of the questions. So I encourage all of you who can to stay on for that discussion. We usually have a really lively, interesting discussion in that last half hour. So in the chat, you're now gonna see links to bios for Ms. Strinyak and for Ms. Tramontano. And I'm gonna briefly introduce both of them. Katrina Strinyak is a legal and policy officer in the Directorate General for Research and Innovation of the European Commission based in Brussels, Belgium. Her work focuses on the legal aspects of the European Union's research and innovation programs. She also worked in the legal department of the Polish government agency, the National Center of Research and Development, as well as the Demanski Zakszewski Polinka in Warsaw, Poland, one of Poland's largest law firms. Ms. Strinyak received her LLM from CUA in 2012. Between 2012 and 2019, she worked with LLM applicants, students, and alumni as a coordinator of the CUA Jagiellonian LLM program. She received her law degree from Jagiellonian in Krakow in 2012 and joined the Warsaw Bar in 2016. Karen A. Tramontano is co-founder and chief executive officer at Blue Star Strategies, an international consultancy that works to solve political policy investment and resource challenges facing today's businesses, governments, and organizations by engaging governments, the media, non-governmental organizations, and other stakeholders and allies. From 1997 to 2001, Ms. Tramontano served in the White House as Deputy Chief of Staff to President Clinton. Her White House portfolio encompassed a wide range of issues, including international trade and transatlantic relations, as well as economic and financial issues concerning the World Trade Organization, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. In 2001, Ms. Tramontano served as a chief of staff, as the chief of staff for President Clinton's transition when she established his office and presence in New York City. Ms. Tramontano is founder and president of the Global Fairness Initiative, a nonprofit organization working to promote a more equitable and sustainable approach to globalization. She serves as a lecturer and the executive master of European and International Business Law Program at the University of St. Gallen in Switzerland. She also serves as a senior advisor to Guy Ryder, director general of the International Labor Organization in Geneva. Before joining the White House, Ms. Tramontano served as chief of staff to the mayor of the District of Columbia, Sharon Pratt, chief of staff to two presidents of the Service Employees International Union and counsel to the United States Senate Committee on Health, Education, Labor and Pensions. She's a regular commenter on Bloomberg TV and other programs on international trade and US international policy and politics. See links in the chat for some of that commentary. Karen also was the student body president at our law school in my first year of teaching. And in that role, she pressed the law school's initiative, a law school honor system, which continues to evolve and serve the law school, both on our DC campus, but also serves as the basis for the exam administration and conduct rules in the Catholic University Agalonian programs. And here's my favorite line from her bio. As an aging triathlete, she holds a fifth degree black belt in Taekwondo. So, uh, Wojciech and Luke, uh, excuse me. So, we've, uh, so we are now ready to head off. So, Kasia. Thank you, Professor Wharton. Thanks for, for the introduction and, and thanks to Karen for agreeing to be my commenter. Um, so, good evening, everyone, or good afternoon for the participants uh, joining from the US. Uh, so, as, as Professor Wharton said, uh, my name is uh, Kasia Strinyak and I'm, uh, I, um, got my LLM diploma in 2012 from, from the CUA. Um, and for the last four years, um, I've been working for the European Commission. Um, I'm based uh, in Brussels. You can see a, a Brussels landscape uh, um, as, my, as my background. Um, and I've, uh, I'm a legal officer at the commission. Um, so uh, my work uh, focuses on the, on the commission uh, research program, the multi-annual research program 
which of course depends on the EU budget, which is the, the topic of, uh, of my presentation today. Uh, so I'll be talking about the budget making process in the EU and, um, just, and we'll give some context on, on the policy of, um, of this process. So um, let's start. So just uh, a very quick overview on the European Union because um, it, it's probably obvious for, for most of the participants, but I also think that for our US um, guests, um, maybe the European Union and the details of its functioning, it's not necessarily the daily bread. So just a few words on that. Um, so the European Union um, is the international organization that uh, is composed of the, of the countries um, of, uh, of Europe, so member states. Um, and the inter European integration uh, dates back to the 50s, but actually the, the current shape and the powers of the EU they date back to 2007, when the Lisbon Treaty was signed by the member states, um, amended the constitutional treaties of the EU, um, reformed it, and so it gave it um, a full legal personality. So throughout the years, of course, more um, European states joined the Union. Uh, we are now 27, uh, 27 after, after the Brexit, um, so we used to be 28. Uh, now the 27 is, uh, is the number of the European Union member states. And um, I think it will be useful to quickly go also through the, through the institutions of the EU, um, because then uh, the, I will talk about them later uh, when talking about the budgetary process. Um, so for the executive institutions of the EU, we have the European Council. So this is composed of the, of the member states' national leaders. And it's a high level body basically um, setting policy agenda and um, setting the directions uh, in which the union will go. And here on the picture, we can see the current president of the, of the European Council, uh, Mr. Charles Michel. And on the right, we have, we have another executive institution. So the commission, the European Commission composed of 27 commissioners. Um, the European Commission proposes and implements legislation. It's divided into, into directorates dealing with different um, areas um, of uh, economic, uh, economic uh, categories, areas. Um, and we can see the current president on the picture on the right. So this is Ms. Mrs. Uh, Ursula von der Leyen. And then we have the legislative institutions. So first is the Council of the, of the EU. Um, and I know that this is a bit confusing because just on the previous slide, we have the European Council uh, composed of the national leaders. Here is the Council of the EU, uh, which composes of the, of the national ministers. Um, and this, um, this Council of the EU is, is a lower level body, let's say. They, um, they co-approve uh, or reject legislation. And they actually meet in different configurations, depending on the subject being discussed, because they actually discuss um, concrete matters. And the interesting thing about this, uh, this uh, body is that it's, um, its presidency um, of, of the council rotates among the member states. So um, now we have Portugal um, that chairs the presidency for the next six months until June uh, 2021. And on the right, uh, European Parliament. So uh, members of the European Parliament are directly, uh, directly elected by the EU citizens every five years. Um, and uh, the Parliament also co-approves and rejects the legislation. And we see the Speaker of the Parliament on the right, uh, Mr. David Sasson. And just to mention that these four institutions, so the European Council, the Commission, the Council, and the Parliament play um, role, the, the, a role in the uh, in the adoption of the of the budget, so I'll be definitely talking about them later in this context. But I also want to mention the judicial institutions that the EU has. So we have Court of, of Justice of the European Union, uh, whose role is to interpret the EU law and settle disputes, and the Court of Auditors that audits the implementation of the EU budget. And then we have the European Central Bank, um, which oversees the EU financial system. Uh, especially with regard to the countries uh, who, uh, which uh, have adopted the euro currency. 
And after this, this brief introduction, um, uh, going forward towards the, the concept and history of this long-term budget that the EU, uh, EU has. Um, so this multi-annual financial fra framework, so MFF, is basically the EU long-term budget. Um, and uh, it, the concept of the multi-annual budget started in the 80s uh, because it, it turned out that it's quite problematic to agree on it every, every single year. And uh, there were some discrepancies between the, in, between the EU institutions. There, were, there, there was a budget that uh, was, uh, was adopted late. And so it was decided that this multi-annual perspective um, is, will, will enhance discipline and will improve the implementation. At the beginning, this MFF have just had a form of the agreement between the institutions, but now it's a legally binding act. And it's established for a period of five years minimum, uh, but usually it's seven years. So, so the one, the last one we had was, uh, was the seven year um, MFF from 2014 to 2020. And now we are entering a new one, um, which will uh, include um, the, uh, the dates of uh, 2021 until 2027. And um, how, how is this budget funded? So um, this long-term budget is financed uh, through several sources of income, uh, but the most important um, is the, uh, the contributions from the, from the EU member states, simply. So basically, own resources, which are based or of, on the gross national income of, of, the, of the country. We also have um, other revenues, so import duties or, or fines that are imposed on companies breaching the EU competition rules. So in this case, the, the European Commission is empowered to, uh, to impose fines, for example, in, uh, when it uh, identifies anti-competitive practices, for example. And uh, from the legal perspective, so the procedure for adopting this long-term budget, the MFF is laid down in the treaty on the functioning of the EU. So the draft is proposed by the commission, the draft of the, of the MFF, then it's adopted in the form of a regulation and uh, the council um, and the parliament um, do it uh, via special legislative procedure. But the European Council, so the one composed of the, of the EU member states leaders, also plays um, a very important political role in this procedure. So this was uh, the theory of how it's done from the legal uh, point of view. And now I want to go through um, how, how this process, how this process looked uh, when it comes to the current MFF. So the preparation started already in 2018 when the commission prepared its initial proposal. Um, of course, uh, this was based on the lesson learned from the previous MFF. So there were some increases in, in some areas and decreases in, in others. Um, then the parliament uh, had uh, its say and uh, commented on it. It, it uh, didn't have this, exactly the same views. So it proposed um, some changes. And then the negotiation started um, in the Council, in the European Council. Well, they, they didn't go um, so fast. Um, by uh, February 2020, there was still no agreement um, on the MFF. And then, um, as we know, the outbreak of the pandemic uh, happened. So the, the, there were massive consequences and, and massive, massive impact on the economy. Um, which uh, complicated the negotiations uh, because the, the European Council and the Parliament basically asked the Commission to come up with a new proposal uh, that would also include a recovery fund um, in response to this pandemic. So we were um, back to square one a bit when uh, the Commission amended the proposal and presented it in May 2020. And then uh, the the budget, um, well, the, the commission actually presented the whole package, which included the, the amended proposal of the MFF, but also the proposal for a separate regulation that establish, uh, establishes this recovery instrument called Next Generation JU, uh, which, uh, which uh, well, whose, um, whose objective is to support the recovery in the aftermath of the, of the pandemic. 
and also um, there was the, the amended the proposal to amend the decision on, on the own resources to allow to basically ask the member states um, to um, to contribute more um, in uh, to finance the EU expenditure. So these was the three elements that the package um, included. Of course, uh, this also um, caused some changes concerning the structure, the size of the MFF, because this all um, was adjusted. And again, um, this proposal went um, to the European Council to be discussed um, in July 2020. <clears throat> and there was a political agreement on, on the MFF. Uh, but then uh, the European Parliament um, voted a resolution in which it stated that um, it, um, it also has some of uh, the pro priorities of its own that it wants to see um, in the MFF. And these included the creation of also of the effective rule of law mechanism. And um, so the negotiations between the, uh, the, offic the, the official negotiations between the parliament and, uh, and the council and the commission started in August. And the political agreement was reached um, in November. And then uh, the budgetary package um, was composed at, um, of, the, of the budget of this new um, own resources decision, allowing to ask more contributions from the, from the states. The recovery package and the rule of law budget conditionality, uh, which I'm going to talk about a bit more now. Um, so the, what is the rule of law mechanism um, that was introduced? Um, so where did it come from? Um, the, the rule of law is of course one of the fundamental um, values of, of the union. And, um, and although EU spending, EU expenditure was, was protected by, by various uh, mechanisms, the deficiencies in the rule of law was not really directly addressed in the context of the EU expenditure. Um, and as there were recent debates on, on deficiencies with respect to the rule of law uh, in the member states, so it became an issue and the idea floated and, and was developed to actually link this rule respect for the rule of law in the member states to the budget. Uh, the countries that sparked this debate uh, were Poland and Hungary. Uh, so in the recent years, there were recommendations adopted by the Commission, um, resolutions adopted in the European Parliament. It was discussed in the Council uh, when it comes to the situation in these countries with respect to the, with respect to the, with regard to the respect of the rule of law. Um, and so um, that's uh, where it, that's, uh, how it how it started this idea to to introduce this mechanism uh, to the budget, and uh, when it was introduced um, at the very final steps of the MFF adoption, actually Poland and Hungary um, they uh, threatened not to agree uh, to to the whole package of of the budget if this uh, rule of law mechanism is adopted. And uh, so um, in December 2020, the compromise um, was, uh, was searched and it was achieved um, at the end um, when it comes to, to the form of this mechanism. So um, just, to, just to explain a bit more how it, uh, how it will work, what was agreed. So basically um, the commission is now uh, empowered to to establish a so-called generalized deficiency as regard the rule of law in a, in a member state. So if it considers that there is um, a problem with the rule of law that affects uh, the principles of, of sound financial management um, or the protection of the finances of the union, um, it can uh, make its assessment, its analysis, liaise with the member state. And if it still uh, considers that, uh, that the risk uh, or the breach uh, exists, it can propose to the council um, that these mechanisms should be triggered. And so the payments from the EU budget to these member states can be suspended or frozen. Um, so that's, um, that's the idea, that's, um, that's how it will work. And it will not only apply if the, if the funds are misused directly, like in case of corruption, but also if the commission thinks that there is a systemic breach of, of uh, fundamental values 
uh, that should be respected by the member states, so such as democracy or the judiciary independence, because it considers that in the broader picture, this also um, affects the management of the EU funds. And um, the idea is also to protect the final beneficiaries. So if we have a small company that already received a grant uh, from the EU budget, and then this breach is identified and the payments are suspended to the, uh, to the member states, well, this, um, this company should still uh, get the grant and it's only the next installment that should be paid to the member states that will be suspended. So it, it is to protect kind of the final beneficiaries um, from, from the situation where um, the member state um, breached the, 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 the rule of law mechanism. Uh, so just kind of not to punish them for that. Um, and going a bit back, so that's the compromise. And uh, actually the, the initial idea was uh, that this mechanism was even broader. So it was, <clears throat> excuse me. So the, the first idea was that um, it will also, uh, it would also apply to the retroactive payments from the previous budget. So this, this was, um, this was removed um, after, after the discussions uh, with Poland and Hungary. Um, and then uh, the Commission also declared that it will further clarify the application of this mechanism. So it will seek the advice of the Court of Justice, then it will finalize the guidelines uh, on that matter, and only then it will start actually apply, um, to apply this mechanism. So we may say that um, it, um, it was actually agreed at the end uh, in the um, smaller or so a bit softer form that it was um, it was foreseen at the beginning. And after that, uh, we reached uh, the final agreement was reached in December uh, 2020, um, and the financial package agreed uh, it amounts to 1,824 billion euros. So these include the actual budget, the MFF and this recovery instrument, which is, um, which is the money on top of the budget, so it does not um, form part of the, of the budget, is, um, is a top-up, um, and it will, uh, it will be composed for, of, um, uh, also of the money that the Commission will borrow on the, on the financial markets on behalf of the Member States. And so the regulation on this new budget entered into force on the 1st of January 2021, uh, so as, as it should. Um, so um, it, was, it was finalized, the agreement was finalized last minute, but well, just on time. Um, and just to, just to give you a bit of, of uh, the idea how, how the budget is, is composed, what are the figures? Uh, well, obviously the, um, the recovery instrument, so called Next Generation EU, it, it's, a huge, um, it's a huge portion of these funds on, on top of the budget. Um, as, as we can see here on the graph, um, the, the cohesion, resilience and values, so this is the category that is, uh, that is broader. And uh, here uh, the money for the, for the recovery and to help uh, with the aftermath of the, of the pandemic um, will go. Also, um, there is a big target uh, when it comes to uh, climate. So this is the second uh, biggest chunk of, of the budget. Um, basically, the, the, the principle is that all the EU expenditure from this budget should support the climate objectives, uh, should be consistent with the Paris Agreement and uh, the European Green Deal. Um, and um, also there are funds, um, there are funds designated to help with this transition to the green economy, so to address the, the social and the economic consequences of reaching these objectives. Um, so there is um, a just transition fund, uh, for example, which is a tool uh, where the funds uh, will, be, will be given to the, to the member states and regions which are dependent on fossil fuels. And so uh, this will help them prepare for the, for the transition necessary to achieve the reduction in, in, in the emissions by 2030 and the climate neutrality uh, by 2050, which is that uh, EU objective. And actually Poland will, uh, if I'm not mistaken, be the biggest beneficiary of this fund. Um, 
And here um, another overview, so we can we can see how the budget uh, how the budget is divided. So again, um, this um, recovery after the pandemic is obviously is obviously um, um, in the in the middle. It's the most important aspect. Also the the climate. So this involves also the funds for agriculture, of course. Then quite uh, quite a, a big portion of funds for the innovation, research, and digital. So we see the Horizon Europe, the research and innovation program. And that I work with, so so that's uh, that's also quite big. Um, when it comes to uh, because probably that's interesting uh, for uh, for the Polish audience. So um, Poland is uh, is expected to receive uh, about fifty seven billion euros from the recovery instrument. Twenty three of this is um, is to be in grants and the rest in loans. It will also receive uh, 60 billion from, uh, from these cohesion funds. So these are funds um, that aim at reducing uh, differences um, between the regions. So, to, so the idea is to help the underdeveloped uh, region um, to, to achieve the, uh, the standard, uh, the average of the European Union. And of course, there are also other funds, but uh, it's uh, it's uh, difficult to give the actual figures at this point. Um, and just uh, a quick information about the, this recovery instrument, the, the top up. So how, how will it work in practice? Um, so basically the member states of the union will, will uh, submit their, their plans on how they want to use this money, um, how, they want, uh, how they want to um, to, uh, to go about the recovering after the pand pandemics, inv uh, boost investments um, and help with, uh, with the economy. And then these plans will be, will be assessed by the commission, um, then adopted um, <clears throat> by the council. And then the payments uh, to the member states will begin um, and they will implement the plans report on the progress. And then this will be evaluated. Um, ex post and also um, in the middle. And that's it uh, from me. Thank you very much for uh, for listening. Oh, and just a little disclaimer um, at the end, uh, uh, just to mention that uh, I work for the Commission, but the presentation was not given on its behalf, so all the mishaps and potential errors are on me. Uh, to be clear, um, and I will give the floor to, to Karen um, to, to comment on that. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. That was an excellent presentation and um, very, very informative. And as somebody who uh, does a fair amount of work in the EU, I learned a great deal. So thank you very much. Um, so just to, um, to comment, I thought uh, a contrast with the uh, with the US might be of, of interest to the, to the audience because it's a, a very different process uh, and, a very, and a very different result. Um, so the, the process in, in the United States is that the president submits a budget in, in February, in the first week of February and President Biden submitted his, his budget about six days ago. And the budget, um, again, unlike what we just learned, um, the budget is very much a narrative document. It does have numbers, but the numbers really are not controlling. The narrative uh, is what the president uh, envisions the nation to be doing in a year. Um, and it's not multi-year like the EU, it's an annual budget. And the president's uh, budget you know, may or may not be uh, approved because it's up to Congress to actually uh, adopt a budget resolution and also appropriate funds. So what the president's budget does is it sets out what federal policy should be, what expenditures should be, what revenue should, should be in terms of tax revenues. And it also um, comments on uh, domestic priorities such as defense, education, healthcare, um, and if there's any spending or tax policy changes. But the real debate is in Congress um, and you're hearing the debate right now in, in real time, because uh, not only has President Biden submitted 
uh, his budget, but he's also submitted, very similar to what was just discussed in the EU, um, a recovery package, if you will. And that's the $1.9 trillion that you may hear um, if you uh, are listening to the US uh, news. So the interesting thing about the US budget, about 62% of it is mandatory. Um, it's about mandatory programs. So in, in US, that means Medicare, our elder care program. Because um, we, unlike in Europe, we don't have universal healthcare. So we have an elder care program. We have Medicaid, which is a poverty healthcare program for people who fall below poverty. Um, we have a, a social security retirement program that all of us pay into as workers, as well as a disability program. Other programs that are mandatory are our food assistance programs, nutrition assistance programs, as well as military retirement. All of that takes up about 62% of the US budget. So the other 38% is where the fights in the US happen. So once the president submits a budget, his narrative, then Congress uh, adopts a budget resolution in both houses, the House of Representatives, sometimes thought about as the lower house and the Senate uh, sometimes thought about as the upper chamber. And the House and the Senate don't adopt a narrative, they actually adopt numbers. Um, and those numbers relate to uh, both uh, the mandatory, mandatory programs and the discretionary programs. And the interesting thing um, that can sort of be compared with the rule of law mechanism in a way, um, the budget resolution, once it's adopted, has to include a reconciliation directive. And that reconciliation directive directs both the Senate and the House to adopt legislation that would implement the mandatory and discretionary programs of the budget. Now, we're probably hearing more about reconciliation in the United States. And reconciliation, by the way, does not mean anything about actually reconciling in a political way. Uh, what reconciliation directive does is reconciles legislation to the budget resolution. And the most important thing for the purposes of, uh, for President Biden's purposes uh, is that reconciliation, that reconciliation directive allows the House of Representatives and the Senate to bundle both numbers from the budget resolution and legislation in a one-time mechanism that can be passed by the House of Representatives and the Senate by a simple majority. It happens once a year and it can only be used for legislation that is not extraneous to the budget resolution. And what that means is the legislation cannot be extra extraneous to either mandatory spending, as I described, or tax, tax policy. And so for those of you who may be listening uh, to the US news about should President Biden rely on reconciliation or should he approach this in a more bipartisan way? That's what this debate is about. And there's also a debate going on is what is extraneous? And one of the proposals that President Biden has put forth is a proposal to increase the minimum wage to $15 an hour. Current min minimum wage is about $7.25 an hour. Um, which puts somebody below uh, the poverty line, actually. And what is happening right now is there is a debate as to whether increasing the minimum wage to $15 an hour is extraneous, is separate from tax policy and mandatory spending, or is it integral to tax policy and mandatory uh, spending? 
that decision, whether it's extraneous or integral, will actually be made by a non-political parliamentarian in the Senate. And she, it's a woman, and she will decide whether the increase of the minimum wage will stay in the reconciliation uh, directive or it will be taken out. And this is a huge issue for workers um, in the United States. I think most commentators think it will be found to be extraneous and will be taken out. Um, but what will happen once, uh, once that determination and other determinations are made by the parliamentarian, the budget resolution and the reconciling of the legislation, which will largely be President Biden's recovery from COVID-19 will be passed in the Senate by 51 votes and in the House by, by a simple majority of Democrats. So it'll probably be something like 222 to 211. Uh, the steps after that are appropriations um, in each of the committees will be given their numbers from the budget resolution and they will appropriate money to the 19 agency uh, programs. And those appropriation bills should be passed by September 30th, they won't be. Um, and so the Congress has two options. One is to pass a con continuing resolution, which will allow the government to continue functioning. And the other is to shut the government down. And in my uh, term uh, in the Clinton administration, we had two government shutdowns. Um, and the most recent government's shutdown was about 16 or 17 days in the, in the Trump administration. So hopefully there won't be a government shutdown and uh, in, instead uh, the Congress will stay on track and appropriate. But it is it's sometimes a misconception with some of my European colleagues in that the president just proposes a budget. The president has no authority over legislation the president has no authority over appropriations. Uh, those two main functions of government happen uh, in our system uh, through, the con through the Congress. And, but for uh, the Reconciliation Act, nothing, no legislation can pass the Senate without 60 votes. And currently, as many of you I'm sure have read, if you follow US politics, the division in the Senate is 50-50 with a deciding vote going to the Democratic vice president. So it's a very different system uh, than was just outlined by the, by the EU. And, uh, and there's a lot of um, uh, sort of political play in, in the system uh, and it is not multi-year at all. So um, hopefully that gives you a quick overview and I'm gonna uh, stop right there, but I'm gonna, begin uh, the Q&A by, by directing a couple of questions to my colleague, okay? So um, the rule of law uh, issue that uh, you discussed, I know was, was covered very, very closely in the news media as well. You know, briefly, what would have happened had an agreement not been, been reached? Mm -hmm. Um, so if, if the agreement on the budget would, uh, ha hadn't be achieved in time, so then the rules uh, basically state that, um, that the, previous, um, the, the, the previous framework, the free previous budget from, the last, from last year is extended until the, the new one is adopted. Uh, so the commission would have to draft uh, a budget plan using the 2020 ceilings. But then it would be um, the spending would be much limited because the new programs uh, that are foreseen under the new budget um, couldn't be uh, couldn't uh, go forward because there was no legal base. Uh, there would be no legal basis as uh, as the one that uh, that they have the expires in 2020. Um, so, for example, this new the the research and innovation program that I'm working uh, with. Uh, so, it was the program was being prepared to, to work, uh, throughout the last year, uh, but starting it would be impossible. Um, it would have to be, have to be put on hold until the MFF uh, is finished. 
and uh, among the consequences as the as the eu budget is the substantial investment tool uh, it mobilizes investments um private and public so i think it would definitely hamper the um, the economic growth and um on the side of of poland and hungary uh, so there were um, some information in the media that I'm sure some of, uh, of the participants followed that um, if they persisted with the veto, um, the assumption were that the Commission might actually come up with the proposal to implement the recovery fund without them. Uh, so just uh, to give the legal, um, legal point, to, to, to make a legal point on that, uh, potentially, uh, this would be possible through the enhanced cooperation procedure which exists, uh, which exists in EU law, where nine or more countries can, uh, can move uh, with a program uh, together without the other member states. Um, it's, the, the, this is the procedure designed to overcome blockage of the proposal when some countries want to go forward and other, uh, others uh, don't. So that's potentially what was speculated that uh, might happen um, towards uh, these two countries. Uh, but this is uh, not confirmed. This is just uh, based on, on uh, the, the media information, basically. Thank you. So, so it's similar to a continuing resolution in that it just it continues as is, but no new programs, even if they're designed, can. Yeah, can... And, and also um, actually the spending every month is is uh, th this is called the system of provisional twelves. Uh, so basically, every month the spending has to be restricted to one twelfth of the of the budget of last uh, year. So, for example, if there are outstanding payments uh, to to make. Um, uh, they can be delayed because uh, simply the expenditure is limited to a, to a very, um, very, very strict uh, ceiling. So uh, that's also um, a problem. So that the, I would say it goes on, but um, but it's it's all very slow and and very limited uh, in a way. So that's uh, that's actually a very good thing that uh, that um, it was adopted on time. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Let me ask you another question. Uh, one of the uh, larger um, allocations uh, for, for spending was on climate change. And I know, you know, in, sometimes it's very um, challenging for, for the EU to be relevant in people's lives in the European member states. So how how does that focus on climate change uh, and also the transitional funds really help uh, the member states and in particular the citizens in the member states? Um, so um, the idea is that the, the EU budget combines resources at the European level. So it allows the member states to achieve more than they would achieve separately. Uh, simply by the economies of scale, the leverage effect, so um, preventing the duplication of, of their efforts, and also, of course, addressing the cross-border challenges. So the coronavirus pandemic is, is an example. Um, the climate change, of course, the terrorism uh, threats. Um, so in, as, as mentioned before, in terms of the pandemics, um, so the recovery fund will provide really um, a huge influx um, of, of funds for the member states uh, to boost the investment, uh, to help them recover from the, from the crisis. Um, and also this focus on the, on the um, on, to do that, to do this recovery in a greener, more sustainable way. Um, I think it's an important feature. Um, and I think um, it's, um, um, it's actually um, it's actually well the the EU budget the EU budget is actually something that can be um, that can be benefited from by by the citizens by the different programs uh, we can uh, give an example of Erasmus programs where the student uh, exchange uh, is financed but also I think a very good example is the cohesion policy that I mentioned. So this is uh, an example of how, how did this budget impact people's lives uh, directly. 
uh, because these are funds spent exactly on projects um, helping uh, reduce economic and social uh, disparities within the regions. Uh, and they are supposed to help with uh, development, uh, job creation and growth. So they are encompassed in um, other thematic funds. And I think that's a good example where you can have an infrastructure project funded. And so you can see it in your city or, or in your area um, that this is actually the, the direct effect of, of this um, EU budget being implemented and put into place. So let me go back to uh, one more question. Um, in the, so the EU has this seven year funding cycle um, and in the US um, we're lucky if we can get through one year uh, funding <laughs> cycle, um, ex except for the de Department of Defense, which has a, a sort of a 10 year plan and, and even though it's annualized funding mechanism, um, it at least looks outward, but that is the only uh, ministry that that operates under with any foresight. So, mm -hmm. what do you think the advantages are, or what are the pros and what are the cons of a seven-year funding cycle? Um, so, I think the the pros are definitely the the stability, the predictability for for the invest uh, for the economic actors and investors who can rely on this long-term information uh, for their decisions. And I think it's particularly important uh, when it comes to, to this transition to green economy that we are now focusing on because investing in all these new technologies and, and new sectors, well, that's a huge investment. So I think the certainty of the framework is a big um, advantage here. But of course, uh, seven years is, uh, is a long time. So, uh, so this has to be balanced uh, by flexibility because of course uh, the revision of, of the MFF is possible, but then seeing how complicated the process can get, uh, this is not the ideal solution to, to change it when necessary. So um, it has to have, uh, and it has actually uh, certain flexibility instruments already built in. Um, and uh, they are predefined um, and they, um, especially now with the lessons learned from the previous budget, from the pandemic and the migration um, crisis. Um, so, um, so it has certain, uh, certain possibilities to address new emerging priorities, unforeseen events. Uh, there is also a, a Brexit adjustment reserve uh, to counter the possible adverse consequences of, uh, for the member states of the Brexit. And also um, because the budget is actually divided into specific headings, so categories, um, let's say, and there are margins left uh, in these headings, especially in these headings that proved um, uh, more um, less foreseeable. Um, and they came out under the greatest pressure, like migration, like uh, like border management, health. Uh, so these um, these margins are considerably uh, bigger to to allow to, for flexibility. There is also a midterm revision of of the MFF uh, in the middle of the implementation, and then it can be also modified in a simplified way without going through through the whole um, process um, as as during the adoption. So I think it's, um, it's, it's now pretty much balanced uh, to, to allow for these necessary flexibilities uh, for, for, the, for the challenges that, that, can, uh, that can appear on the way. And uh, let's hope that it will, that it will, uh, it will be sufficient and, and it will work as, as we hope. Thank you. Thank you. Great. We've now reached um, our 60 minute mark and just 30 seconds or so. So we will turn off the recording, but then we're going to flow right on with questions. Uh, I see one in the chat now. I, several have occurred.